You know, when we look at it from a circadian standpoint, studies are now pointing to the fact that you can get leptin or insulin resistance independent of the type of food you eat, just in the absence of, you know, a fully synchronized circadian rhythm. And this is how powerful this stuff is. Everyone has this. Everyone seems to have a disrupted circadian rhythm because of the environment we live in. And there's only a few of us that understand that food is, is obviously very important, don't get me wrong, but can't ignore the fact that our circadian rhythm is, is very much en entrained to the onset of some of these diseases and resistances that then causes us to overeat and become sick. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Andy Munt from Australia. Andy is an entrepreneur and the founder of Blue Blocks, which is a blue blocking glasses company. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on again, Sim. It's always, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, it's uh, good to see you. And the last time we talked on the podcast was maybe like a year ago or something. Uh, but uh, what, what have you been up to since that time? Yeah, so it's... Um... I think it was maybe September, October time last year when we last spoke. So almost a year now, which is, is way, way too long. Obviously, we've been speaking on and off, um, off camera, which is always great. And been following your, uh, your adventures across uh, the various summits uh, that you've been involved in. So that's been, uh, been awesome. I guess from, from my point of view, we've, we've been delving deeper into the research and we, we've been coming up with, with more lines on our products um, as well. We've been, um, you know, posting a lot in our light and health group about all this new literature that's coming out on, um, you know, how circadian clocks are, are entrained through um, different sort of external cues as opposed to light. So, you know, I thought it was a, a, a good time to reach out to you again and, and talk a little bit about, you know, these new, uh, new studies and, and what, uh, what, what else we've learned really uh, in that last sort of 10 month period. Yeah, for sure. And uh, good to talk with you. But uh, if anyone wants to like uh, listen to the previous talk that goes into more detail about how blue light affects your physiology and how it affects your sleep, especially, then I'll leave the link to that show in the description. But uh, maybe like just for, you know, the new listeners, can we give like a brief overview about blue light and how it affects your health and uh, sleep, especially? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always good to start off with with the basics. So, you know, as as mammals and, and every single mammal on Earth has something called a circadian rhythm. OK, so what that means is that our bodies um, and every cell in our body is um, basically in sync or should be in sync with the rotation of, of the Earth and the spin of the Earth. Um, now, what or how our bodies get that information primarily from the, um, I guess, the orbit of, of our planet is that um, it, it, it basically takes cues from light and dark signals. So the way you entrain your circadian rhythm is you, um, your body um, will release a hormone called cortisol when it's time to get up. Um, you'll go and watch the sunrise or be outside, I guess, from an ancestral point of view. Um, and that light will tell your brain it's daytime um, and it will send messages to other cells in the body to say, right, it's daytime. We need to produce the hormones um, to be active and, and alert during the day. Now, when it comes to the nighttime when the sun sets and we watch that, the cues of darkness and maybe the reds and oranges of, of sort of ancestral campfires told us that it's now time to relax, not to produce cortisol, and to allow um, serotonin tryptophan to basically be turned into something called melatonin, mm. um, which makes us feel sleepy, want to go to sleep, and, and have a really good night's sleep. Now, that's all very well in an ancestral world, but the issue that we face today is that we're exposed more than ever to artificial light. So what that's telling our brain after dark is that it's still daytime, it's still midday, it's still you know, early morning, and it's right. saying keep cortisol levels high, um, and you don't need to produce melatonin. So we're struggling to sleep, um, struggling to get off to sleep, not, maybe not having the best quality, deep, restorative sleep, and, and REM sleep, which helps with you know, that clear out of dead cells and, and um, you know, making us feel fresh and alert the next day. So you know, we've, we've, when you look at light um, and, and modern lighting, it's very different to what we had many years ago, maybe in Victorian times or, you know, times of, of the early 20th century, or even up in really to the 50s, 1950s and 60s, when it was an incandescent, very dim, low lux light. We've now got these really bright, 
LED sort of um, light bulbs that we put into our house that give off a high amount of blue light. And it's with this blue light that really is the trigger from the sun as well in the mornings and, and the afternoons that tell us to be alert and awake. And this is causing massive increases in, you know, in, in the first instance, insomnia and people having chronic fatigue, um, not being able to sleep properly. Um, and it's also then um, being linked in a lot of studies to things like weight gain, um, insulin resistance and, and certain cancers and also neurological diseases as well. So, you know, that's very sort of broad. I know um, you referred to the last chat we did back in October and if people want to sort of listen to a full hour on, on why that is and how that is in relation to light and definitely have a, have a listen to that because it's some really sort of good explanations. We delve, you know, further and further into these topics. But I guess in a nutshell, what's happened is the advent of artificial lighting, which has allowed us to not have any darkness anymore, even when we sleep, has led to a whole host of metabolic diseases, lack of sleep, and chronic illness in, in, in our industry today, in our, in our um, environment today. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And, you know, I've seen some um, people say that after the invention of artificial lights, the kind of average length of the you know, human sleep has decreased by about two hours or something. And just because of the, you know, the ability to be awake in the night and uh, be, you know, constantly under these blue lights. And yeah, like, like you said, those kind of disruptions in the circadian rhythms, they're linked to a lot of diseases. And uh, even, even in the kind of presence of sufficient sleep, you know, even then the, uh, the disruption in the circadian rhythms and the blue light exposure itself has like a negative effect on your health especially when it comes to like blood sugar management and uh, even like satiety signaling and so on. So it's not just that the blue light is make is making you sleep worse. It also has like a independent effect regardless of the sleep uh, quality. But but yeah, at, but, at, but at the same time the, but the, the blue light itself will definitely jeopardize your sleep quality. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and you had a um a really good um point then about you know the satiety and and the feeling of of being full and things. And, and there was a study um, I posted in Light and Health um, a couple of days ago. I, I tagged you and a few other people in it to have a, have a look. Um, but it was all about how a disrupted circadian rhythm has now been proven um, to, to basically affect leptin signaling. So, you know, a lot of your listeners will understand the role of leptin. I mean, I'll, I'll describe it very, very basically. But, you know, when, when we gain body fat, we have a hormone called leptin that also increases in the um, adipose tissue. Now, what leptin does is it tells the brain that when there's a lot of it in, a, in abundance, um, it will go to the leptin receptors and basically say, you've got enough body fat, you don't need to eat as much to gain more um, weight and become easy target for a predator back in ancestral times um you can stop eating so your satiety levels increase you know you don't have to you know you have maybe a smaller meal you feel full um and, and you're totally fine now the opposite is true when you're very underweight and you need to gain fat you're and you'll know it from say if you're cutting trying to lose weight you get hungry more leptin will um basically signal to um the brain that there's not enough fat eat some more food and we'll store it as fat now the study that came out showed that basically a disrupted circadian rhythm, so you're exposed to too much artificial light after dark, you're maybe working night shifts, um, maybe um, you've, you know, you're, you're not waking up to 11, 12 in, in the morning and missing the sunrise, independent of food can actually cause leptin resistance. Now, the way that the study was talking um, was that it can actually switch off the leptin receptors so there'll be a lot of you know say an overweight person has a lot of leptin circulating in in the blood it won't be able to cross the blood brain barrier to hit the leptin receptors and actually say to that person stop eating so you know that i guess that the way that um i guess the food literature describes things like insulin resistance or leptin resistance is you know an overabundance of this stuff basically impairing the the leptin receptors or the insulin receptors and flooding the system with it and it basically needing more and more to um to, to basically get that signal across which then causes a resistance to, to insulin but you know when we look at it from a circadian standpoint the studies are now pointing to the fact that you can get leptin or insulin resistance independent of the type of food you eat, um, just in the absence of, uh, you know, a fully synchronized circadian rhythm. And this is how powerful this stuff is. It's, mm. it's 
you know, having just a, a, an, everyone has this, everyone ha seems to have a disrupted circadian rhythm because of the environment we live in. And there's only a few of us that understand that, you know, food is, is obviously very important. Don't get me wrong, but you know, you can't ignore the fact that our circadian rhythm is, is very much, you know, and, and trained to these, you know, um, onset of some of these diseases and resistances that then causes us to overeat and become mm. sick. Yeah, it's such an underrated topic and it's a new new field of research as well. Uh, but especially like maybe maybe like the reason why the, misrup the, the disruptions in circadian rhythms cause these issues has to do with like it causes simply like more excessive stress and inflammation on the body if it has to kind of catch up on the uh, circadian rhythm of the environment, so to say. If you're out of sync, then you're kind of lagging behind <laughs> and that's just causes more oxidative stress and uh, oxidative stress in excess is just causing uh, more damage to your body and that's where all of the diseases also you know start off from yeah and that's 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 so true as well you know um the, the amount of inflammation that's been causing the body from a, a disrupted um, circadian rhythm is um yeah causing and, and wreaking havoc at a mitochondrial level and you know when you um when you actually look at melatonin a lot of people when you say what is melatonin they will say to you it's the sleep hormone mm -hmm. and that's a partial truth okay so melatonin is also a very very potent and powerful antioxidant yeah. so when there's inflammation in our body whether it be from you know um in the environment, maybe pollution, um, maybe, um, you know, a lot of exercise, maybe you've eaten some bad food or, or whatever it may be, or, or general disease that, that could happen. You know, melatonin is the most powerful antioxidant that actually goes and, and, you know, utilizes a lot of this information or helps repair it. And, you know, it's not just about using um, or creating melatonin in the body to, to aid sleep. It's, it's that powerful mm -hmm. antioxidant effect it has as well. And, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of people, and, and it's still up for debate. You know what, what is the main purpose of sleep in a human? And um, you know, I guess what we know so far, in a very broad sense, is it's um, apoptosis, autophagy, the clearing out of adenosine, and the you know growth and repair. They always say. Mm -hmm. um, now, why would our bodies want us to secrete melatonin at that specific time of the day? Um, and it makes complete sense to, to me that it wants to be secreted at that time of the day to aid the body in clearing out all the waste product, all the um, damaged and um, dying cells to keep us um, healthy and keep inflammation low. So, you know, it's not a coincidence that, you know, nature, you know, does this kind of thing. And, and you know, there's always, you know, more than one function for some of these hormones as well. And, and, and melatonin is, is, is one of those, I believe. Mm. Yeah. and. Uh... Also, like in order to produce melatonin at night, then you also need to be exposed to morning sunlight. And uh, the, the following the pro proper earlier circadian rhythm is somewhat of a crucial part in actually getting a good night's sleep in the evening, so to say. Yeah, exactly that. And, and the, the, the problem you have is people look for that sort of one stop fix. And, you know, people can't just come to, to, to blue blocks, buy blue light blocking glasses, wear them after dark. Mm -hmm. And then expect to have this perfect night's sleep if you're not adhering to the laws of, of circadian biology, which is you need to be up with the sunrise, letting your eyes and skin see that, that sunrise, whether it be for a few minutes or 30 or 40 minutes or most of the morning, depending on what time you can allow. Um, because you need to produce something at that time of the day called serotonin, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then that, um, in, in conjunction with tryptophan, which is produced in the gut through um, IR and UV light at that time of the day as well, will then later on go um, and, and be synthesized and, and translated into melatonin. And it's really interesting as well, like I've started to, to look a little bit at food in relation to, um, you know, this kind of response as well with tryptophan um, being later turned into, into melatonin. And um, I've, been, I've been speaking quite a bit to Chris Masterjohn as well, who, who uses my glasses and um, is very, very interested at the moment in, in sleep and circadian rhythms, which is, which is really good. It's good to see these guys, you know, getting a little bit more involved in the circadian side. And, you know, I found that by listening to Chris's work that um, I actually improved my deep sleep scores um, using, using my aura ring mm -hmm. by actually having a small amount of sort of sugary carbohydrate before bed. And I was really intrigued. I was trying around with these playing around with these things. And I spoke to Chris and I said to him, I said, why, why do you think that's the case? And he explained to me that, that carbs actually push tryptophan 
into the brain um and what that does is yeah. that actually then can translate into your melatonin after sunset um and it also suppresses the waking signal in in your brain as well so it actually allows you to relax and drift off yeah. to sleep and um you know i've been having it's, something like banana like before bed something like that then yeah it's been perfect it, it's like uh, a trip trip of trip of intents to compete with the other amino acids uh in the brain to cross the blood brain barrier so if you take the carbs then insulin is, is going to enable the uh, other amino acids to be shuttled into the cells and that enables tryptophan to reach the brain so yeah that that's the, like that's the reason the perfect combination for a good night's sleep is some protein and carbs because uh, that's you know increases serotonin which then gets converted into melatonin and carbs themselves you know they cause you know drowsiness a little bit and they cause like this small like a small hypoglycemic crash is actually a good thing if you time it yeah. at the right time and uh, you don't overdo it so you raise your blood sugar and you drop down and that small dip just makes you feel like very tired and you just want to, <laughs> want to fall asleep after that yeah and that's that's spot on i think it's worth also sort of saying as well is is we're, we're probably on the same page here that we're not suggesting a very large protein meal before bed yeah. um what we're talking about here i guess is, is a smaller protein meal with, with maybe a smaller amount of um of, of carbs in there we'll explain a bit i'll explain a bit why in in, in a bit but you know the the way that, that chris has explained it in, in a lot of his writing and, and to me is that um you know protein is actually in too high a quantity before you go to bed so we're talking one or two hours before you go to bed here mm. actually stimulates the waking signal um in, in in the brain as well as opposed to mm. carbs turning it off so if you I guess if you balance it, you probably want to have more carbs than, than protein before bed. Um, I typically only have a very, very small amount. Um, and what you find as well is protein is a lot harder to digest as well than, than some of these carbohydrates. And when we're, you know, preparing to sleep, um, we don't want to be eating too much after dark because digestion will then take control um, rather than autophagy and your apoptosis and, and your clearance of, of adenosine um you know we all know and, and you talk about it um in great detail and, and explain it so well on, on on the autophagy side of things and you know the fasted state and and you know when you actually look at it from a circadian standpoint um you know eating your largest meal before bed is is really going to be hugely detrimental mm. to your health now the way i understand it and, and there's been some recent studies on this as well that have basically shown that um you know light which is the basically the potent stimulator and entrainer of the um central master clock which is located in the hypothalamus um supercharismatic nucleus that goes without saying it's 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 a, a proven fact but when you actually look at your peripheral clocks what a lot of the academics were doing is they were looking at things like leptin ghrelin glucose um and these types of um these types of things that would actually be pivotal in, in in training each cell in your body independent of light but what they found was they that none of these um hormones or um or stimuli were actually present in all the cells which led them to to insulin mm -hmm. so insulin is, is is found like um igf1 um, receptors are found in pretty much every cell in, in the body um and they have now all the, these academics have actually looked at igf um one um, and insulin being a potent entrainer of all of our peripheral clocks. Now, what that means is that um, the time we eat is very much um, circadian um, in, in respect to we have got to make sure that all our peripheral clocks, like in our liver, kidneys, etc., are all in sync with the master clock. Mm -hmm. Now, I was always led to believe that your biggest meal should be the first thing you do upon waking. But actually, when you actually, when I've delved a little bit further into the literature here, there's suggestion that the most optimal time for one to eat is about four hours after the cortisol response in the mornings. Mm. So you'll wake up, get your cortisol response, watch the sunrise, um, and you should actually be waiting for around about four hours. And this is to do, very broadly speaking, with um, I guess the period genes in um, each of these cells being utilized by, I guess, the insulin response at that time of the day to physically entrain those specific cells. So it was very interesting when I started to read a little bit more on that, that um, yes, the general, um, I guess, uh, mantra of having that biggest meal first um, and then having smaller meals throughout the day is very true, but not having it too early is also mm. another 
um, another aspect we need to look into. And when you actually look at some other studies that, that we've been reading as well, um, they did one um, about five or six years ago. It's a really interesting study, and I've, I've sent these over to you prior to us talking, so I think you know, a lot of people want to delve deeper into this, that they took um, two groups of people, um, gave them the same calories, same macros, same exercise plans, same bedtimes, everything, okay? But the only difference was meal timing. So one group had their last meal before 3 p.m., and the second group had their last meal after 3 p.m. And what they found was it was like a weight loss um, study. The group that had their last meal before 3 p.m. actually lost a hell of a lot more weight than those that had their meal later on in the day. So, you know, this also sort of led me on to talk a little bit about, in, in my group, a little bit about intermittent fasting. And the, the default intermittent fasting protocol that I, I see probably 90% of people do is that they will have um, you know, a fasting period in the morning and they may start eating maybe about one or two o'clock in the afternoon and stop eating maybe about eight o'clock at night. Now, this is just like, from a circadian point of view, the worst thing you can possibly be doing because of all the stuff we basically just, um, just described. You're, you're gonna basically desynchronize your peripheral clocks with your master clock. Um, you're gonna disrupt your sleep and you're gonna have a hard time you know, you, you lose weight initially because you just will. Um, that's just just the laws of thermodynamics. But eventually, you'll hit a stall and wonder why. And you know what? I, what I try and teach a lot of people is just flip that over. Have your largest meal about you know ten, eleven o'clock in the morning, and and stop eating before three p.m. and have that fasting period. Um, you know, from three p.m. through to you know eleven the next day. And you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's really hard to do. But when you actually entrain your clocks properly it only takes a few weeks of this um, and you start getting up and watching the sunrise and you start having your meal when you get the insulin response after the cortisol response about three four hours afterwards you actually find it's really easy you know you eat when you're hungry which is always around about that 10 11 o'clock um, have you know three or four meals or, or one meal or however many you want in your period before three o'clock and then you're not hungry in the evening and then you're recording ridiculous sleep scores um, in terms of improved deep sleep and um, you know improved REM sleep and all you're having as, as your light sort of snack before you, you go to bed is in my case I, I just have a very small banana maybe half a banana um, and you can have a little bit of protein as well if your goals are, are more aesthetic in nature but yeah it's re really interesting all this stuff is coming out with meal timing and I guess insulin is a um, in trainer of, of most of the, the, the sales clocks. Yeah, like, uh, you know, when you are waking up in the morning, then the cortisol, it's also going to make, make, make it easier for your body to store the food that you're eating as fat. So you don't want to be eating like when you're stressed out or with high levels of cortisol and like miss or, you know, eating, eating food and suppressing that cortisol response will also kind of make you miss out on all of the benefits of cortisol. Like cortisol isn't bad all the time. Cortisol actually yeah. makes you burn fat and uh, triggers your body into this into the state of uh, higher ketone production as well. So you don't want to be suppressing cortisol all the time. And that's why kind of leveraging that small time frame of, let's say, ignition, ign igniting like your own body's own fat burning me mechanisms is such a like a you know, easy way to kind of implement this idea of time restricted eating. Uh, but, yeah. when it but, but when it comes to like early, ver early versus late time restricted eating, then I think that the research also shows that there isn't like a huge difference in terms of like final health outcomes if you actually do it in a time restricted manner and within the same hours. Like the study that you mentioned, uh, yeah, it's true that the group that ate earlier in the day before 3 p.m., uh, they like lost more weight, they had better blood glucose control, etc. And they also had like this expression of sirtuin genes, which are these longevity genes. But the, the group that they were compared to, I believe that that group wasn't even intermittent fasting. Like they were eating throughout the day. They weren't, they weren't you, know, uh, you know, skipping breakfast, et cetera. They were still eating at the same hours and yeah. just, you know, within a larger time frame. But another group or like another study uh, actually took, they took like 16 men and they put them on two of these different time uh, schedules. One group ate you know, from uh, 8, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And well, like the, sa the same group, but they, for one first, the first week, they ate from uh, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Then the second week, they didn't do any, any fasting at all. They ate like, like a regular person. And the third week, 
they ate from uh, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. So they, you know, ate, they ate their calories within six hours and they fasted for like 18 hours. And there wasn't like no, no difference in terms of uh, body composition, no difference in blood sugar regulation, etc. So the idea, I think the main point is still that uh, it should be like the, the biggest effect comes from the suppression of the food intake within a certain time frame, so to say, the constrictant. And, you know, I, I do agree that you don't want to be eating a whole bunch of food before going to bed and you probably w- would want to stop eating like four to five hours before going to bed. But I think like the small nuances uh, aren't that huge in terms of if you eat like or if you stop eating after 3 p.m. or after 5 p.m., etc. Like, you know, there's this buffer zone. <laughs> I think that in most cases, most people, they if they just stick to the some of the principles that you mentioned, like waiting at least like four hours before eating after waking up and stopping eating like four hours before bed, then I think like yeah. the, there's not going to be like any significant difference. Completely, completely agree. And, and you know, I guess we, we generalize quite a lot when we are sort of relaying some of these, um, some of these facts and, you know, you just got to experiment, you know, um, yeah. as, as an individual, um, what works for you, you know, take these principles, not as gospel in terms of, right, it's 3 PM. Don't eat another bite afterwards. Like, you know, like, like I was saying, I'll have a banana about, you know, six, seven o'clock at night and then go to bed about half nine. But, um, you know, just making sure that that large meal isn't, isn't right before bed and, and right. um, you know, having it about two, three hours, four hours after, after you wake. And, you know, it's really interesting you talk about cortisol and, and we know that there's a, there's a great need for cortisol um, in, in respect of context um, in, in health and, and wellness as well. And, um, you know, at least the two points that I was going to make and I'll stick with the first one, which was food related. And then I'll come on to the next one, which is exercise related. And um, I guess what we're doing is, um, you know, Cortisol is, 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 is risen by the, I guess, the, the presence of blue light, hence why when the sun starts shining through your, um, your window in the morning, you wake up, get that cortisol response, and that's a really good thing, makes you feel alert and awake. But, mm. you know, as I alluded, alluded to at the beginning of, the, of, of this conversation, um, you know, blue light from an artificial source also raises cortisol. Um, and like you suggested just a minute ago, you don't want to be eating food with with very high chronically high levels of cortisol so the fact that we're under artificial light all day and all night um we are you know actually eating um probably a hundred percent of our calories with our cortisol levels very very high you know we'll get up in the morning um we won't go and see the sunrise we'll sit under artificial light and eat breakfast cereal or something like that then we're going to go lunch we're going to sit in an office cafe under artificial light and eat a lunch and then what we're typically doing then is in the evenings we're going home and the way that the the culture here in australia us and and the uk is you'll have your largest meal before bed under artificial blue light again so you know you're you're eating under chronically um exposed blue light and chronically high cortisol levels so you know there's only so much you can do in terms of um shifting your macronutrient change to a more favorable maybe ketogenic carnivore paleo type um setup um but then you hear of these people hitting stools and hitting um problems with their their weight loss and you know maybe it's these little sort of circadian hacks that one could do if they're having a hard time overcoming a a weight loss plateau maybe they need to look at it slightly Mm -hmm. differently in in so much that okay my my diet's on point i'm following everything simland and luis villasenor and rob wolf is telling me but i've only lost weight up until this point and now i can't so maybe they need to listen to what jack cruz and chris master john and andy mant is telling you which is you know maybe sort out your circadian rhythm maybe not eat before bed and maybe these little changes at an n equals one level will, will help and This brings on, I guess, the second point you mentioned, um, or I was going to mention when you suggested cortisol and, you know, all comes down to circadian um, rhythms again. And, you know, the the time you want to work out, um, and and correct me if I'm wrong here, because this isn't my forte, I would suggest would be when cortisol levels are higher in the body, which would mean maybe a circadian, um, I guess, slant towards exercising in the morning. So maybe a good routine for someone that wants optimal health both from a physical, mental, and circadian perspective, is to get up, watch the sunrise, do your exercise, then eat, then stop eating before it gets dark, um, and then have your fasting into those like late afternoon and early evening periods. I think it. De- I think it depends on like what type of exercise and uh, what's the particular goal as well. Like cortisol is yeah, it increases alertness, 
and uh, that can be useful for maybe like some form of a cardio workout but uh, the circadian like, like i've seen say, from the circadian perspective that like your muscle contraction and strength tend to actually increase later in the day like in the afternoon yeah. because your kind of nervous system warms up so to say and you'll also be less prone to injury because your you know muscles are you know all loosened up and uh, warmed up so yeah it depends on like what kind of a workout and uh, i think waking up in the morning and you know starting to move your body is like super important from a yeah. circadian perspective again like to get your lymph flowing and you know movement and physical exercise are another like signaling factor to the circadian rhythms and doing it in the morning with like the right uh, morning light morning sunlight I mean, that's like a good good recipe for starting the day i think yeah absolutely i, I couldn't agree more and, and it's funny it's like how we like I haven't got the understanding you do on, on I guess the biomechanics and, and um, nutrition side of things, but it's, it's very interesting that my training is, is, is very similar to that. So I'll do, you know, I'll get up in the morning, watch the sunrise and I'll move, I'll walk the dog and, um, you know, just do a, something light and, and sort of cardiovascular. And then I work out, I guess, later in the day. So normally between 12 PM and 2 PM. Um, mm-hmm. The reason I do that is that I'm, one of the unfortunate souls that has to work out in a gym um, under artificial blue light. So what I did was I actually um, did a little experiment, um, you know, just, just in my own time um, to test the, I guess, the um, intensity um, and component of blue light in the lights in my gym. Um, and to be fair, this is, this is typical of any fluorescent or LED light and actually tried to match it as close as I possible as close as I possibly could to the amount of blue that would be present in, in, in sunlight at that time of the day. So mm-hmm. what I found was the LED lights from um, the gym and, and um, you know, in my house as well were very similar to the amounts of blue um, sort of ratio wise um, to around about midday to o'clock. So I thought that, yeah, I can go in and train, have my, my yellow blue block, block of glasses on during the day as well, but also mitigate to somewhat the damaging effects of actually training under the artificial light by training at that specific time of the day and you know this is another another reason why um a lot of bodybuilders are now turning to um blue light glasses when they work out and we're um because a lot of them train in in the evening when they're exposed to um you know they train three times a day you know train in the mornings in the afternoon and in the evenings and they're exposed to this artificial blue light which is wreaking havoc with their sleep because you know they're training at eight nine o'clock at night and then coming home and trying to sleep and having a hard time and we we were approached about six months ago by a guy called Chris Gethin, um who's will be known to a, a lot of your um listeners as a very prominent trainer in the U S Welsh guy. And, um, you know, he was training for, he basically lets himself go and then does these comeback videos and and training routines where he's like putting himself through the paces and eating all sorts of like random stuff, but getting himself back into, into shape. And he wanted to, to do it, um, this time, but actually looking at it from a more biohackery sort of holistic sort of way. And he's been adopting sort of infrared saunas, um, you know, light, red light therapy, and also um, wearing blue blocks, blue blockers um, for when he trains um, after dark. And, you know, again, this is all N equals one, but the feedback we're getting from Chris is that he he's just hasn't felt stronger in the gym than he has done in previous comebacks and he's, he's only getting older. Um, and he, he puts that down to an, an exceptional quality improvement in his sleep. And, and he tracks his, his fitness with aura ring as well. And he's been sharing some of his sleep scores and his, his deep sleep's gone through the roof. Um, just by changing when he's training by, if he has to tra- train it after dark, he's covering up a lot more of the skin. He's wearing his blue light blocking glasses, um, getting an amazing sleep after these, after these sessions or, or better sleep than he was getting. Um, and then that's given him, you know, a knock on effect of having more energy to, to train better, um, than in, in the next day. So it's really, really interesting that sleep is such a powerful, um, component of, of, I guess, um, sporting output and yeah. you know we've we've also worked with a lot of um, a lot of famous athletes um, we're, we're very lucky that they've all approached us which is really good and, and it's usually these professional athletes that um, and, and sort of 
out of the box thinkers, I guess, like yourself, Sim, that that fall into these um, sort of alternative um, ways of thinking um, before the masses do, because you know we're always looking for those small improvements. And um, you know we've worked with, um, as I mentioned in the last show, I think the Australian national football team to manage jet lag. Mm. Um, we've also worked with a guy called Jordan Henderson, who anyone who follows football knows he's the captain of Liverpool Football Club. Um, he wears the glasses because after dark he came to us and he was just like look after training I'm knackered but I can't fall asleep and I was like what, well, what do you do Jordan and he said well I come home and we have watch tv then I go and play on on my xbox um and then that's normally about midnight and I can't sleep and I got training the next day and I was like well yeah. there's your problem you need to manage the light and he kind of got it um a little bit because Stephen Gerrard who manages Rangers oh, utilizes our glasses and he spoke to Jordan told him to come speak to us and we're like look no one's telling you to give up your beloved computer games like do it it's downtime it's cool but just wear these glasses and and yeah he was basically tried those for a few days playing his games and he was like he goes it's, it's good and bad he goes he goes he goes I can I can I, I can play my game it's not a problem I can see it and I'm getting a really good night's sleep and I'm feeling better when I'm training and Ultimately, they've won the European Cup, so it must have maybe 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 not put it all down to that. But they did something. <laughs> so he's saying that he couldn't play on this computer game for more than a couple of hours because, you know, and ultimately I told him it's because you're producing the melatonin, you're, you're going to fall asleep and lose sleep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's it's so many sort of ways that sleep can impact performance and it's not just about the physical output as well it's a big big thing at the top level and even even with the everyday person that wants to lose a bit of weight or, or focus in the gym is is that word i've just said focus yeah. the cognition and reaction times um they all decrease after um one night just one night of sleep deprivation and you know you can kind of say like a messed up circadian rhythm from lack of sleep is very much similar to, to jet lag. When you get off a, a long haul flight flying from Europe to America or something like that, or when you've had a few drinks and you're feeling a little bit drunk, it's that kind of feeling. And you know, you, you, you know, you can sort of get by, but you know, you're not quite you. And um, you know, if you're, you're sort of playing professional sports, like, or even amateur sports like you, football, cricket, rugby, things like that. Um, you know, and you're, be, you're given tactical advice of what to do or, or you have decision-making to do um, within any sport. It could even be tennis, I guess. Yeah. That, that, that sleep deprivation um, through too much blue light or eating at the wrong times of, of day is going to really decrease your performance. So, you know, this, this goes for, for any sport, any amateur professional that's looking to improve output, cognition, learning ability when it comes to a new sport, that it all comes back to sleep. Yeah, yeah, so true. And like, uh, you know, they say that, you know, the actual growth happens during rest and, uh, you know, even memory or attention happens during, you know, sleep and also like fat burning primarily happens during sleep as well. So one of the biggest reasons I think that people hit weight loss plateaus is that they're getting suboptimal sleep and they don't sleep, you know, long enough. Uh, you know, I, I've even heard like people like Michael Phelps or Roger Federer, they sleep like 12 hours or something like that just, just because they're, you know, so physically active and uh, they need that amount of sleep. So yeah, like a lot of people, there's just, you know, part of the reason has also to do with maybe having the poor values or the wrong values, having poor habits, like, you know, playing video games late in the night or, uh, you know, sleeping in, etc., or just, you know, over caffeinating, etc. All of those things, you know, play a part in uh, how good your sleep actually is. Yeah. And that's, that's a, another good point. And, and one I, I mentioned I did a um, sort of quite an informal talk at um, when I was in Copenhagen a couple of well about eighteen months ago actually um, with the guys that run the biohacking circle over there and we were talking a little bit about caffeine and it led me to do a little bit more research on it when I um, when I got back to Australia and I guess it, both tie in really nicely to what you were talking about with with Federer um, and Michael Phelps sleeping twelve hours a day so you know we we both know that there's two types of sleep okay like how to get to point a which is being awake and point z i guess right at the end of the alphabet which is um going to sleep now the first one we've spoken about is circadian so you get up in the morning watch the sunrise go throughout the day dark cues stimulates melatonin feel sleepy go to sleep very very basic but there's also something else called sleep pressure mm. now when we 
have any metabolic process, whether it be breathing, organs working, exercise, running a marathon, playing tennis, swimming, whatever it may be, um, we use something called um, adenosine triphosphate, so ATP, which people will you know, know that you get from eating food, transferred into ATP, energy, um, you can move um, and, and do what you need to do. Now, the byproduct of adenosine triphosphate is something called adenosine, believe it or not. Um, and what happens is when we're running metabolic processes, adenosine builds up in the brain. The more adenosine that builds up in the brain, the more sleep you're going to need to then clear out that adenosine byproduct, waste product from your brain. So, you know, if you're sedentary, um, sitting around on the couch, you're not going to have as much adenosine built up in the brain as, say, someone like Michael Phelps or Paula Radcliffe, who are running, you know, marathons and swimming, you know, long, um, long distances. So um, they're, they're going to need more sleep for that reason. Now, one of the most potent um, suppressors of adenosine um, receptors is caffeine. Mm -hmm. So the way caffeine works is it blocks or impairs the ability of the body to communicate with um, the adenosine receptors, which basically is telling your, your body, oh my God, the like, adenosine's going up, 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 right, I need to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you drink caffeine, blocks that. It's not telling the brain that you're tired. It makes you feel alert. You, you get a buzz. And in some people that aren't high metabolizers of caffeine, you know, that can last for up to six hours. So, you know, people having a, a cup of coffee or even, or, or a Coke or um, even a diet Coke, you know, if, if people don't want the sugar, like that is full of caffeine. You, you have that at three or four o'clock in the afternoon and you, you ideally want to be going to sleep at half nine to 11 o'clock at night. That caffeine is still going to be blocking or impairing the communication between your body and the adenosine receptors and telling your body like oh i can be awake and it's great and then couple that with blue light and you just got like a whole shit storm of like major issues of of being completely out of whack circadian speaking your sleep's going to suffer your insulin blood glucose levels levels leptin are all going to become resistant and out of whack over time um and there's only so much diet can do to reel those issues back in and it's a whole package you know i yeah. i hate it when the food people sit there and say it's all about food. And I also equally hate it when the biohackers turn around and say, it's all about light. Mm -hmm. And it, it winds me up. Why can't it be about both? It's about everything. It's about what you eat, it's about your, your, your non-native EMF and EMF environment. It's about your, your temperature cues, your cold, your warm. It's about light. It's about food. It's about exercise. It's a whole suite and lifestyle thing. And, you know, part of, I guess, my mission at the moment is, is really trying to bridge the gap between what my community believe is is the be all and end all and food isn't important and light is the best thing ever and this is the new diet that you need to follow just light and you'll be fine um with the the, the food world that think food is is everything and mm. the the one industry that i'm seeing it uptaken in in the most is the ketogenic people now maybe it's because i was, was heavily involved in it years and years ago and um wrote wrote a small book on it it's on amazon but that was another lifetime ago um but they seem to pick it up like Luis villasenor um didn't need to approach him came to me and started speaking about light um was speaking at the moment to, to rob wolf um on the paleo keto side uh, about sort of how to educate people more about light and, and how important it is in combination with food and craig and maria emmerich as well um came to us and, and spoke to us about our glasses and now they're talking about blue light glasses and light management in relation to circadian rhythms and health in combination with keto and it's really good to see that um i guess the way it way it happens is you know keto and paleo are very much out the box thinkers as well but it's good to see that that gap is really closing up and it's something that unfortunately people like Jack Cruiser, who are like the pioneers in this kind of, um, you know, light um, way of thinking, are very much close to, to the fact of working with food people to try and get a joint mes message across. It's more a case of just let's bash them, tell them how, you know, they're doing it wrong and we don't care about them. Let's work together. Like mm. you guys have such a knowledge on nutrition and, and exercise, um, whereas we have such a good knowledge on how light works. And there'll be other people out there like Nick Pino who are, are very like queued up on EMFs and 5G and the issues that's going to have. And there'll be other gurus out there that, that will be very, very... Um, 
you know, well educated in other specific areas that we need to look at as well. And I just want to make sure everyone works together to build up this like perfect lifestyle where you've got your specialists in like specialists in food, your specialists in, in, in exercise, et cetera, et cetera, that all come together and start talking about each other's research and how important it is in, in creating the overall perfect lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, so true. And I completely agree with you that it's, it's never this you know, single thing that is going to fix all of your issues and make you healthy. It's, it is a holistic approach in a sense that it includes everything that we talked about, like nutrition, circadian rhythms, sleep, exercise, uh, you know, things like cold and other, other environmental hacks, so to say. But yeah, it's a holistic lifestyle that, you know, and you can't really, you, know, you, you shouldn't, you know, just focus on one single aspect because uh yeah you know it, it won't even matter like like if you if, even if you think that for instance nutrition is the most important part but you're still unhealthy then it doesn't really matter because you're not getting the results that you desire so to say or like any other approach like if you're like a hardcore exerciser or just you know focusing on light then you're not seeing results then you're just you know there's something wrong in or there's something missing and you're not seeing the actual holistic picture so to say yeah it's so true it's so true one, one thing i was going to say as well because i i know that people will comment and and write this in in when you post this <laughs> this video so i want to rebut it before it's even asked is a lot of people will say well our ancestors wouldn't have eaten their largest meal at the beginning of each day um, and people always come back with that and it's like yeah they, they wouldn't have done um, number one like we probably wouldn't know when they ate their largest meal of the day but two they probably did eat it late at night now the thing is with our ancestors and I'm talking like paleoethic times is that our ancestors would not have or nature would not have wanted our ancestors to be completely shredded um, like a 5% body fat bodybuilder um, because they would have to go out and, and hunt maybe for days, maybe for weeks to find food. So they would need to run off ketones to, for fuel. Maybe they would have some carbohydrate from tubers and things like that. But they would eat before they went to bed because they wanted them to gain weight. They wanted them to put on mm. a decent amount of weight so they you know, would, would have enough fuel to then go and hunt the next you know, woolly mammoth that they would have eaten back in the day. So you know, I, I just thought I'd have to throw that one in there because always, people always say that like, our ancestors wouldn't have eaten, they would have mm. you know, just eaten whenever, but it's a completely different era. You know? they, they're eating for survival. Um, and yeah. you know, as, as we know, nature doesn't want us to be either overly obese and it doesn't want and nature doesn't want us to be absolutely shredded they want that sort of somewhere in between to keep us alive so you know it, it goes without saying that you know yeah what our ancestors did to a certain point is is lessons for us in terms of how to live but you know it's also the same principles of what our ancestors used to live by that actually causes a lot of issues into in today's thinking so you know, if we completely follow what our ancestors did and eat massive meals before bed, that's going to be bad news because our ancestors didn't eat under artificial light. They mm. didn't eat things like cheeseburgers or, um, or, or even like, you know, a massive you know, amount of, you know, meat before bed every single night. Um, they might have done that maybe for two or three nights and then they may have gone without any, any source of, of mm. animal protein for, for, a, for a period of time. So, you know, that, that's sort of the rebuttal to that, that, you know, yeah, they would have done, but they would have gained weight because nature would have wanted them to, to keep them alive. Yeah, I think, uh, well, hunter-gatherers probably, they ate completely randomly and at, at, yeah. different, at, at different times every day for like on yeah. one day, they might have had like their biggest meal in the morning, on another day they had in the evening, and then they went like two days without eating, etc., it's just that what's, you know, you know and the problem or, or the way they got away with it is that they were under, you know, constant calorie restriction and they weren't overeating in a sense. But in the water, modern world, we have like somewhat of a different situation and we have to like keep in mind other variables. And I think that trying to emulate the lifestyle of ancient hunter-gatherers isn't the most optimal thing for humans either. Like it's like you said, they were just trying to survive, not thrive. And they don't, they didn't have like the, you know, they didn't have any other choice but to do and to do like just eat whenever they could and uh, vice versa like in the modern world we just have to make sure that we do what's best for the modern human not for the ancient human because we're not the same species almost anymore spot on yeah absolutely spot on i think exactly the same way <laughs> right. what are so many like anything else you do to like optimize your sleep in addition to the other things that we already talked about 
Yeah, absolutely. So like we, we know the, the ones that we, we describe like food. Um, one of the biggest ones for me, actually, um, biggest real, really massively improved my sleep um, was, was the introduction of, of lavender um, mm. to my sleeping environment. And I always thought, oh, it's an old wise tale. Like, this isn't going to help me sleep. And oh, my goodness, it really did. I, I have a... Um, like sort of essential oil diffuser and, and also create a natural spray for my pillow. And um, yeah, literally one night of doing that and, you know, my, my REM sleep went, went right up um, with, with the aura ring tracker. Um, and that was, that was amazing. I, I believe it may be something to do with um, stimulation of GABA um, and, and also the relaxation um, sort of effects of, of, of that um, particular plant. Um, so I would highly recommend that. I found that, I originally tried it by buying a lavender plant and I find it didn't really give off that much smell. Um, so it must be when you crush them or something, maybe that, that helps it when, when you turn it into an oil, but we just got like organic essential oil and put it into like a normal diffuser, um, and had that coming out in the room and that, that really helped my sleep. And, um, another thing that really also, it always improves my sleep is, is the temperature of, of my room. Um, I need it to be cool. It's, it's okay at the moment because it's, it's, it's winter here in Australia. So I've got a very cool room. It's about m- maybe between 10 and 12 degrees. So it's, it's probably a little bit on the cold side, but we've got a duvet to obviously pull over. But I find that I sleep so much better when it's cold. Um, the, the, I, I guess it's, it's the cooling of, of your body temperature um, to allow for sleep. You don't want a high body temperature before you go to bed. Um, having said that, I know some of my friends have, have improved their sleep by having a hot shower before bed or a warm shower. Um, relaxes the muscles and causes that relaxation. Um, you know, they're not having a shower and going straight to bed, but maybe they're coming home from work and having a nice warm shower, which, you know, maybe using some you know, organic lavender products in the shower to, to stimulate sort of, you know, the GABA as well. And, you know, that's worked for a lot of people, but it's playing around with things because a lot of people always come, um, come to me saying like, how do I improve my deep sleep? And it's something that I've been working on for so many years just for myself. And I've done so many things that didn't work for me. Um, you know, I tried glycine before bed, did, did absolutely nothing. Yeah. I've had some people that say, taking you know four or five milligrams of glycine before they go to bed is, is really helpful like i said a banana before bed for me and i'm out like a light and having <laughs> like really good rem and deep sleep works for me um like i said my friend has hot showers and and they're fine but i need a nice cold room um the lavender that seems to work i also tried binaural beats um so having specific frequencies of sounds going into my Um, brain which stimulated sort of delta waves which are associated with deep sleep did nothing for me um yeah whereas whereas some people have that on and they're having like you know deep sleep scores go from like 10 to 30 percent in like one night so you really have to um and and meditation as well that's another big one that helps for me being very relaxed and and mindful but you almost have to have a, a list of maybe 10 to 20 different things that people have tried and you just have to experiment with them yourselves like what works for one person is not going to work for another and you know if you're in a very stressful job or you you know you're stressing and worrying about something that's going to impact your sleep and you need to then think that well is is a cold room going to be number one on my list no it won't be if i was very stressed and um and highly strong i'll be looking at meditation i'll be looking at relaxation techniques maybe the binaural beats to start with if you're in a very relaxed state anyway um, and you're chilled out and you know, you're still struggling to sleep, maybe it's the blue light that's causing the problem. Maybe you're eating too late to bed. Maybe you're eating the wrong things before bed or in the wrong quantities. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's about playing around sim. And, and we, we, we alluded to it earlier that, you know, we're, we don't want to say like, right, these are the three things you need to do to improve deep sleep. Um, you know, we were saying the same thing about you don't need to eat any food after specifically 3 p.m. It, it doesn't work like that. They're generalizations and there's so many different, I guess, tools in the toolbox that one can use to um, improve their sleep scores. They really have to look at their own lifestyle and their own problems and, and really think to themselves, how am I feeling? Why do I think I'm not sleeping? And then look at the, I guess, the, the solutions in the toolbox to fix those individual problems. Yeah, totally. And uh, that, that's a good point that everyone else reacts differently 
to uh, these you know hacks and uh, these uh, strategies especially like when it comes to nutrition and uh, genes and you know <laughs> everyone has to do their own experiments to see what works for them yeah yeah absolutely yeah people people unfortunately are looking for a recipe card of here's the perfect life um and, and we know it doesn't work and you only have to look at you know these these sort of blue zones and you know you look at like the hunter versus you know uh, Maasai in, in Kenya and you know they both live to really high ages but they both have very different lifestyles and it's, it's like well I need to follow this one and it's like well you're not you haven't got the same ancestry and DNA as those individuals like you need to figure out what works for you um, mm. and, and a lot of the general principles that are out there will work for people but you know you need to look at it a lot more you know sort of objectively and, and subjectively in, in a certain way and in, in, in so much that you know if you're um you know of, of african descent um with your ancestors that live in kenya then maybe a, a more carnivorous type diet is for you but if you're scandinavian who has a long ancestry of eating you know seafood um in in their diet you know that's probably the the the, the type of, of diet you should be mm. following and, and you know you look at it not just from a diet perspective but from sort of other other genealogical perspectives as well from exercise and circadian rhythms and things like that but yeah you've, you've got to and it's hard and, and people just want the easy fix it's human nature but it is hard you've got to put in the hard miles like you know sim and i aren't sat here going like what we didn't wake up one day and go we know the answer to everything this is how we've got to do it bang our, ch our views will will start from research and they'll get stronger and stronger in certain areas then we'll feel like oh my sleep's perhaps not that good and we start researching that and improve it then we might be well you know the exercise isn't getting me the results i want how what am i doing wrong so you, you, people just need to have that open mind of listening to these shows um listening to the amazing guests you have on and then taking bits from each of those shows and being like right i can make that work for me that actually resonated with me I, that, you know and, and and build your own I guess optimal life that way is 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 my advice anyway to people. Yeah, it's it's awesome, awesome advice, and uh, it's a good good point to start wrapping things up as well. Uh, well. Thanks for coming to the show, and it was great to talk with you again. Uh, where can people learn more about uh, you and your work? Yeah, absolutely. So look, I'm I'm very active um, on Facebook um, more than any other platform. So you know, I'm more than happy for people to connect with me personally, um, or, or at least sort of follow me on there. I think I'm reaching near the 5,000 friend request now, but you can still follow. I, I have my profile open, but I, I post a lot in light and health. Um, so that's a group on Facebook. It's, it's about 5,000 of us in there. And we got some real strong minds in, in that group. People like, you know, um, like, like Chris Master, John is in there every now and again. You've got Luis Villasenor, who I mentioned, is, is a member in there. Um, you know, from a circadian perspective, um, you know, got people um, like, like myself that are commenting, people like, um, you know, Tim Gray, who you had on the other day, um, sort of weighs in every, every now and again, um, along with a few others that, that are in, into the sort of exercise and fitness side of things as well. So I wanted to make that light and health group a little bit more. Um, you know not just about it's it's our little you know esoteric sort of like light group we believe this and everyone else can go away i want people in there weighing in doris Lowe, another great person that's in there as well always thinks from an evidence-based perspective and you know i'll post stuff and she won't agree with it and we can talk about it and it's it's great it's just such a fun place to learn um and also the excuse me a bit of a dry throat also the um also the website like blueblocks.com which you'll link to i guess um mm in the show notes as well has has a lot of blogs i'm going to start actually based on this conversation we've had I'm, i've been inspired to write another blog um a little bit more on the food and circadian um rhythms and, and things like that so we'll, we'll get those out um and then just just jump on the website join the mailing list and you'll get access to all the blogs and latest articles that are coming out so those are probably the best places to um to start with um with, with looking myself up um and also i've been on um, quite a few podcasts as well in the last sort of 12 months so just googling my name and podcast you'll find some other ones on there that have you know maybe looked at i did a really good one with lacy lacy phillips actually um that talked more about hormones and managing hormones so if you have any female listeners they found that very helpful we were talking about thyroid function and um you know sort of more women's hormones which is very interesting so you know there's lots out there um but yeah it's been an absolute pleasure you know the last time we talked 
my question was, uh, what's this one piece of advice you adopted sooner that you that improved your body and your mind? But I want to change it up and ask, like, what's this new habit that you uh, wish you adopted sooner since the last time we talked? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I, I think one for, the big one for me is... Um, is definitely meditation, um, definitely for the relaxation. Um, I know we haven't really touched much on it in this um, conversation because I'm really only been doing it for, for sort of several months, but I found that it's really cleared and focused my mind and also managed my stress levels a lot as well. Um, so yeah, I, I would suggest it's it's meditation for, for me and something I'm going to be delving a lot lot deeper into in um, you know the, the, the months and years to come. All right, that sounds good. And uh, well, it's been great talking with you, and uh, looking forward to your future work in this area of new research that I think we all are kind of excited to learn more about. Absolutely, thanks, um, Sim. It's honestly, it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys and and your amazing community. So, yeah, thank you for having me on again. Yeah, I'll see you around. All right, that's it for this episode. If you want to get yourself one of these blue blocking glasses from Blue Blocks, then head over to blueblocks.com and use the code SEAM for a 10% discount. That's B L U B L O X.com and the code is S I I M. Other than that, you can also leave us a review on iTunes and other social media platforms. Check out all the links in the show notes. Thanks for listening. My name is Seam. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.